Good morning, friends. Let's sing a song, shall we? Before we get into our book study. Hope you're all doing well today. Hey, good to see you all here. God together. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yes, we praise him, we thank him. Maybe you have COVID, maybe someone you love does, maybe they have cancer, maybe you're suffering, but we still praise God because he works all things for the good. All, not just some, all, excuse me. I think I might actually have to take this scarf off. You know, I've come to notice seeing myself on camera every day for the most part, which is really not always a fun thing. But I was like, it, it's better when you have some something light around your face. But I think this has Angora. <coughs> I'm allergic to that. All right, so <laughs> it is what it is. All right. So, y'all, we left off. We're, 
our second to last day with the read of God, our penultimate day. So if you didn't look it up, I didn't know what it means. Penultimate, the second to last day, the read of God by Carol Hauslander. What a gift this book is. I can't wait to reread it and like digest it further. Are you, do y'all find yourselves thinking about this book during the day? And like, what is Jesus living in me right now? And then just being attentive to him suffering and my friends like, wow, is he in the tomb right now in them? Is Yeah, it just really is, has me pondering throughout the day. So we left off on page 172 in this book, subtract 14 pages for the 2020 version. We're on page 143 of the study guide, question number four. Why is being satisfied the worst of all diseases? Hmm, that is not what the world teaches, right? Okay, so on page 172 is where we left off. And the, 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 the answer to that question is on page 174. So I just want to like review some of the things that she said that aren't covered in the study, study guide. Okay. So she just talked to she earlier in that page about how the times in our lives when we feel naked, exposed, vulnerable, foolish, unloved, alone, that that is the experience of Jesus being stripped of his garments. <clears throat> and so then she says, and many people, Christ lives the life of the host, like the Holy Eucharist. Our life is a sacramental life. So what does she mean by that? She says, this host life, this life of the Eucharist, is like the Advent life, like the life of the child in the womb, the child in the swaddling bands, the Christ in the tomb. It is a life of dependence upon creatures, hmm. of silence and secrecy, of hidden light. It is the life of a prisoner. Have you ever thought that Jesus is a prisoner in those who suffer? That he is a prisoner in prisoners? That he is a prisoner in the Eucharist? A prisoner of love there waiting for you? It, it's mind-blowing. <clears throat> oh, then she says, The host life may be lived in prisons, in prisons of war, internment camps, hospitals, by the blind, by the mentally ill, all these different ways. And people who have to be wheeled about, washed, dressed, and undressed by others. Father Ubald is experiencing this right now, and he does not like it. None of us likes it. We all like to be independent, for the most part. Some people would rather be, you know, be have people take care of them. And those people, yes, are definitely out there, but... For the most part, we want to be in control of our own lives. We don't want to have it. It hurts our pride. It wounds our pride. Oh, yeah, this was kind of heartbreaking. A short time ago, the Daily Mirror published a photograph of a baby in swaddling bands tied by them onto a cruciform splint. So the hospital was showing this new treatment for obviously some sort of injury to a child. But... It was really the crucified infant Christ. It was a little host baby redeeming the sins of the world in, his, in the passion of innocence. Mm. The suffering of children in hospitals, if you've gone through that. Yeah, Christ, the Christ child suffers in them. It is more in frailty than in strength that Christ reveals himself upon earth. More in frailty than in strength that Christ reveals himself on earth. So we can miss him if we're just looking for the victorious. More in littleness than in greatness. More in loneliness, lowliness and loneliness than in glory. For he is the way that's the title of this chapter. Christ is the way. And such is the way of love. This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then Christ said, it is expedient for you that I go. Why? 
Because then we'll look for him. Then we will seek him. Nothing else but his going breaks the hard crust of our complacency and forces us to go out from ourselves to seek him. This seeking warms charity into life. And then at the bottom, and the complexity and diversity of the needs that Christ wishes to experience in men make us realize why it is that he uses, lots of stars on this, Why he uses such strange material for his purpose. Why it is that lit, why it is, I cannot understand the sins. Oh, lives, not lives, okay. Why it is that lives, which, this is an awkward sentence, (laughs) judged by our standards, are tragic and frustrated, may in fact be the most glorious. In this searching, we become integrated ourselves. It gathers us together and makes us whole. We are saved, and here's to answer the question, we are saved from the worst of all diseases, being satisfied. And she distinguishes this from being at peace, which is a different thing. Satisfied is you don't experience a lack for anything. You're full, you're satiated, you're numb, complacent, satisfied. All of your needs for material comfort are satisfied. And the need of the world, you just don't allow yourself to think about that too much because we're satisfied. The man who is satisfied with himself and with things as they are today really admits despair. Whoa. Nothing can any longer be ugly to us in the sense of being repellent. For in this search, we realize that God is everywhere and everything reminds us of him. Yes. And again, about the popular love songs, like before this longing, this desire for Christ took hold of us, life was rather like a popular song, a little vulgar, a little absurd, But when we're in love, a popular song is informed with a totally different meaning. So true. It it is impossible to know God without falling in love with him. Okay, this reminded me of the most adorable video I have ever seen in my life. And I think I've probably watched it 30 times. And it is a little girl, having been adopted, Asian, probably... um, it's hard to tell how old she is by the way she arti- how articulated is. She's probably six or seven, but she looks really small. So she's obviously got some sort of physical disability. And I, it almost looks like she her little legs, like she has to be maybe in a splint or something. I don't know. But her mom is videotaping her, and the little girl is, is talking to her. And she's um, she and her little sister, Lily, were both adopted. And she was like... And, and she's just so full of wonder and innocence, this little child. And she said, and remember when I was really little and Lily was really, really little, then you came and got us. And she said, that's right. And she said, um, did you hear what happened to my heart? And she said, no, what happened to your heart? And she sounds the mom like a Disney princess. So sweet. I mean, really, it was so adorable. And she's like, Did you hear what happened to my heart? She said, no, what happened to your heart? She said, when I saw you, my heart fell in love with you. (laughs) As an adoptive mother, what? Like, I was like, "Mm." my heart fell in love with Sessie. Like, it was like, we fell in love with each other. She put her little hand on my face. It was such an experience of the wonder and the innocence and the beauty and the love of God in a child. And so she said, when I saw you, when I saw you, my heart fell in love with you. And she said, well, mom, when I saw you, my heart fell in love with you too. And then she said, and Lily? And she said, and Lily too. It was just so innocent, so beautiful. And it's impossible to know God without falling in love with him. That, it was like this little child who had had such a tragic little life before she was adopted, abandoned, deformed, 
the presence of God was so alive in her. And to hear this child say to her adoptive mom, my heart fell in love with you when I saw you. Ah! Ugh. Okay. This is what true beauty and truth just does to me. And I'm sure it does it to you too. Yeah. And what would a morning video be without, I do, without me crying? <laughs> I just have such a longing for heaven. And I, I so... Um, my heart has fallen in love with God with his beauty and innocence and his goodness and yes there have been so many disappointments but he's granted me the desires of my heart he wants to do that the real true desires of our heart to love and to be loved okay Love is infinite desire. Isn't that true? Okay. Only complacency can take away the sharp edge of love. Have you ever thought about love having a sharp edge? Love is known as desire, which is stronger than we are and drives us as the wind drives a sail. Yes. It is expedient that Christ should go because in the search we become aware of the wonder and the mystery that contentment blinds us to. So if you're discontent, that's good. Keep looking for Jesus. That's how he wants it. Hide and go seek. He wants to play hide and go seek. She goes on in the study guide. Hauslander writes, We can never know God exhaustively or completely. And in this life, we cannot know even with the vision of the saints in heaven. But we can sometimes know with knowledge kin to the knowledge of the dead. For sometimes we become so aware of the fierce beauty of God's light that it seems to be known because it is burning within us. This is very like purgatory. Have you ever experienced this? When do you think Mary did? That's on one page, page 162 of the old book, 174. So it's kind of what we were just talking about. Where did she write that we can never know God exhaustively? I think I might have just passed over that. Um, but yeah, that the fire, enkindle in us the fire of your love. Fire is fierce. It burns. So that purifying fire. I think what Mary experienced that. Surely she experienced that. Gosh, I would think throughout her whole life, but especially in the Annunciation. And the loss of Je- in the prophecy of Simeon and the loss of Jesus in the temple and during the passion, of course. Yeah, that purgatorial fire. Not that she had anything to be purified. Except, as Carol Haslander writes, pure, she was purified of the love of her own life, which was a pure love. It was not a sinful love. It wasn't a selfish love where she was totally lost in Christ. At the crucifixion, the foot of the cross, she became one with him. Her life was gone. She was completely hidden in Christ. Okay. Number five, what is your relationship with Mary like? I wish I could hear your answers. Your relationship with Mary. It's evolving. It's continuing to grow. I have to keep remembering to go to her. I mean, praying the rosary every morning has changed me. I've never, I haven't done that consistently in years. So because I'm accountable to you, (laughs) I've been doing it every morning. And to have Cecilia do it with me is so beautiful. I mean, really, that is a gift. That is a gift from COVID. Thank you. Yeah. That I'm here, that extraordinary times require extraordinary measures and God gives extraordinary graces. So I feel like that's one of them. And it's helped me to grow in my dependence upon Mary. 
I guess for me, the, the rosary feels like an umbilical cord to her. And I receive that grace, that milk of the Holy Spirit through her, through the rosary. But I guess I, I feel like right now, in, in many ways, she's just kind of like right here with her hand on my shoulder with me. And like together we're facing the day. Um, I feel like for me, I'm still challenged to really share my heart with her. Because so often I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> um, I just like to stop and like, okay, what am I feeling? I don't, I mean, what am I going through? Um, so, but it's evolving, it's growing. And I do love her. And I know that she loves me. And you. Okay. Do you feel comfortable going to her like a child to her mother? Yeah. Are you confident in her love for you that flows from her love for Jesus and his love for us? Okay, let me read that again. Are you confident in her love for you? Yeah. Well, yes and no. I think part of me still needs to grow in that. Again, um, early childhood relationship with my mom was difficult just because she, my mom had her own stuff going on and just emotionally was not available. So I'm used to being emotionally independent from women because of that. So I, that's something I'm still trying to learn to, yeah, confident in her love for you. It's her love that flows from her love for Jesus in you. And he, you know, he, Jesus cares for you. You know, we really need to get that. He really cares for you. And so because of that, he has entrusted you to Mary. You know, tag team. <laughs> Together, the two of them right now are looking at you. I'm just like seeing this in my mind's eye right now. Like they're shoulder to shoulder and they're looking at each other and then looking at you right now, back at you. They get you. They get you better than you do. They know what is coming for you. They know what you need for today and every day. The plan is for you to see them face to face one day upon your death that they will be there to meet you, to welcome you home. I mean, how many times have we said, Hail Mary, full of grace, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. The two most important moments. <clears throat> and if you don't feel comfortable to answer that question, going to her like a child, to her mother, to a mother that loves her, that, or him, if you're a guy, blessed are you among women, because we're mostly women here confident in her love for you then ask ask what does let's just ask right now mother mary <clears throat> mother mary mama thank you for loving us with christ in christ through christ for christ and we just bring our hearts to you just imagine right now that we're just taking the heart out of our chest and we're putting in her hands. Her beautiful hands. So capable. So tender. So full of love. Are there any knots in your heart of unforgiveness? Of grief? Mother, we ask you to undo those knots. <clears throat> This is kind of funny, but I'm like, I'm seeing her, you know how when you have a sick child, I've got all this chest congestion. Um, I think I also had a little cold. And and the mom would just, my mom would do this, and she would rub that Vicks Vapor Rub on your chest so you could breathe better. It's like I just see her taking a, like a, a balm, a holy oil, an ointment, and rubbing it into our hearts right now with just tenderness and love. Whatever it is you need right now.
That was lovely and unexpected. Okay, so number six. <clears throat> How does devotion to Our Lady flow from the relationship of Jesus with his Blessed Mother and the relationships you are to have with others? I think I need more coffee to answer this question. How does devotion to Mary flow from the relationship of Jesus with her? I'm not sure how to answer this question. And the relationships you are to have with others. I guess we are to be Mary to other people. To as you know, women we're as women, assuming most of you are women, and if you're a man, you love women, we are called to be spiritual mothers, even to women older than us. And to be mothered by other women. It's like Mary in persona Maria. You know, we've heard priests are in persona Christi. And we women are invited to be in persona Maria. To give her our heart, access to our heart, and to love through us with her gentleness, her tenderness, her intuition about what the needs are of the person in front of us kind of a self-forgetful love where she's loving in you and through you and with you. That's what I think how I would answer that question if I understand that question. I don't think I'm smart enough to fully understand that question. Okay. That's the last question. And so I'm just going to read what I, my last little stars and underlines because we still have a few minutes. <clears throat> Oh, here we go. So, but the finding is never complete. We can never know God exhaustively or completely. We won't. until it, we'll, we'll spend all eternity getting to know more and more and more of the richness and the beauty and the glory of God. Where color has sound, flowers have music. Oh, I can't wait. Okay. I love this line. To, to all, Christ is all who look for Christ. He's still the Pied Piper who first enchanted and distributed the house of the newly wakened soul with his enchanting music. That's so true. Like for me, I would say still, I don't know, what, 54 years old, at 16 years old on my high school retreat when I asked the Lord, if you're real, I want to know. And then it was like this extraordinary power came over me, this love. The veil in the temple of my soul was torn open and I experienced him living in me. A joy flooded my soul that I just wept and wept and wept and wept for hours because I knew that it was true. I knew it was true. God was real. He was alive. He was living in me. And that even if I was to die the next day, that love would be there to meet me. It was extraordinary grace. But I'm homesick for that moment. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking for that moment again. I don't know that I'll taste it like that again until I die. So it was an extraordinary grace. It wounded my soul. And I've spent a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of money distracting myself from that homesickness, from that longing. With so many different idols and substitutes that will never satisfy. Only he satisfies. And he doesn't ever satisfy completely. Okay. Some of us, most of us, are like the lame boy who was left behind when the other children danced away with the piper, but the lame boy still heard the music in his heart and still followed. <laughs> I'm just seeing myself as like a little cripple trying to find, follow behind Jesus, like don't leave me. However lame are following, all is well. For the path is picked out by the impress of the child's feet in the, the child Jesus's feet in the dust and our seeking is, in itself, finding. 
a continual endorsement of the promise, seek and ye shall find. So when we seek, it's because we're responding to an invitation from Jesus already in us. So to seek him is to actually find him and to have communion with him, even though it's not fully satisfied. While we are seeking in one another and in ourselves for the lost child, Our Lady still seeks and finds him in us. Isn't that beautiful? Through her, the Holy Spirit has made humanity large, like pregnant with the Christ child. And she who is so essentially ours, who is one of the human race, is compelled with us in a mutual tenderness, which can have but one answer. Little children, love one another. When my heart saw you, it fell in love with you. I have to find that video and post it. Oh my gosh, I love it. The Christhood that she recognizes in us is that we are her children. Mother, behold your child. Okay. So then she goes on to talk about devotion to Our Lady. It is the treasure of the Catholic Church. Um, Mary is not wearied with our littleness. Her smile comes down to us like a benediction through the sea of flickering candles. I'm going to finish reading this last paragraph and then we'll close. And she blesses our wild flowers withering at her feet. That was so precious to me to read that because so often at the end of the rosary, like we cast our roses at her feet. For each one of us is another Christ. Each one to Mary is her only child. Think about that. It is therefore not tedious to her to hear the trifles that we tell her, to look at the bruises that we bring to her. I have a bobo or a boo-boo, depending upon how you said it when you grew up. Bobo for us. And seeing our wound of sin to heal it. That's our mama. All right, friends, tomorrow we finish the book. What a joy it's been doing this with you. I wish I could see your faces and hear your voices, but I can imagine. All right, I'm going to play a song and read your comments. What shall I do? I think I'll do Salve Regina. We'll have a great day. Thanks for being with me. I'll be back tomorrow for our last day. Christmas Eve. And for those of you watching at a later time, hey, Merry Christmas. making me cry.
show of hands, how many of you have read and prayed with the book 33 Days to Morning Glory? We have. <laughs> okay. Another tissue moment, yep. All right, friends, y'all have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow, Christmas Eve. And if you didn't hear, I tested negative for COVID yesterday, and so did Sessie. Hooray. All right, much love. <laughs>